back after the summer holidays and a slightly autumnal evening, um, and I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Um, so we have uh, our main speaker, Dr. Robert Morton, uh, whom I knew when I was out in Tokyo, um, and he's been a professor at Chuo University in Tokyo since 2000. Um, but I also knew him uh, as the editor-in-chief of the transactions of the Asiatic Society of Japan, which is apparently Japan's longest-running scholarly journal. I made a couple of modest contributions to Very it. Very modest uh, contributions. <laughs> um, and, of course, he's here to talk about the book that you can see on the screen, and it's had an extremely positive review, actually, from Sir David Warren, uh, recently ambassador to Japan. Um, but tonight it's going to be introduced by another former ambassador, um, Sir Hugh Cortazzi, who probably doesn't need introducing to most of you here, um, but as well as being ambassador to Japan uh, in the 1980s and having, of course, served as a diplomat in Japan um, back as far as the early post-war period. Um, Sir Hugh is also a prolific uh, scholar of Japan and has written numerous um, books, edited books, articles, newspaper articles, um, and uh, so it's very much in the, in the line of scholar diplomats that perhaps almost started with, with me. So, over to you, Sir Hugh. Ladies and gentlemen, um, can I perhaps move over there? Because it's easier to... Um, very kind, thank you for such a kind introduction. I mean, I wouldn't... I would like to think of myself as a scholar diplomat, but I'm not quite sure whether I'm either a scholar or a diplomat. <laughs> At times, I don't think I'm either. Um, now, uh, I'm very, very pleased to have this opportunity of introducing uh, this book by, by, the, by Robert, uh, because I was always fascinated by Algernon Natural Whitford, uh, who, as you all know, was the great was the grandfather of the, of the Mitford sisters. Mm -hmm. And we have here another Mitford in Lord Greedstown. Um, which I'm delighted that he's able to be here. Now, um, I'm going to start, if I may, by saying, drawing your attention to this cartoon, which um, uh, appeared uh, in Spy, and I will pass it round here. He is uh, a perfect example of, I would say, a uh, an Edwardian dandy. <laughs> and it's hard to think when you see that, and I, I'll pass it round afterwards. Um, uh, that, as a young man, imagine that as a young man he went to Japan. In a very, at a period when Japan was a very dangerous place, just after. And it, it, Japan was totally unknown. And, and his, uh, so he served as second secretary in the embassy. And, or rather, it was in the legation in those days, and this was a very small mission. And he, um, actually was given, he had to work under the, a, a very difficult boss, mm -hmm. Sir Harry Marx, mm -hmm. who was a very demanding man, a very, in, in many ways, uh, a, a difficult man to be working for. But he was given responsibility, perhaps much beyond his um, normal, you know, what one might expect as a second secretary. Yes. Um, he started. Um, he started as a clerk in the Foreign Office, which he found rather boring, and so he managed to get himself posted to St Petersburg, which was then, of course, the uh, one of the more important missions that Britain had. After that, he volunteered to go to Peking. Then in 1866, 1866, he appointed second secretary to the British legation in, in Berlin, which was then in Edo, 
Now check here. There he found himself the number two, as I said, the very fast. Now the British treaty with the Tokugawa Shogunate in Japan of 1858 had opened diplomatic relations between Britain and Japan, which resulted in the opening and establishment of the treaty ports where trade could be conducted. Britain's interest in Japan at this stage was essentially a commercial one, as indeed it has been very often over the years since. But in the 1860s with the Civil War in Japan, the prospect for Anglo-Japanese trade did not look good, and Japan was not a high priority for Her Majesty's government or the Foreign Office. In so far as the Far East fe featured in British foreign policy thinking at the time, attention focused on China and Hong Kong, Japan was very much a secondary consideration at that time. The political situation in, in Japan was complicated. The relationship with the, between the shogunate in Edo and the imperial court in Kyoto was not understood in the West. Japan was a dangerous and unhealthy place and Britain did not want to become embroiled in the affairs of this distant and for them exotic land. The Foreign Office accordingly did not see the need to send a more experienced diplomat to the legation to support the minister. They did however recognize the need to appoint consuls and realize the need for four of Japanese linguists. The ablest of these young interpreters was of course Ernest Sato with whom Mitford struck up a close and enduring friendship. Mitford relished adventure and readily rose to the challenges posed by the exciting events which were unfolding in Japan. In these events, Mitford was cast in a role that has rarely been filled by such a young diplomat. In Osaka in 1868, in the midst of the revolution which was taking place in Japan and which totally altered Japan's way of life, <coughs> he had to represent and uphold not only British interests, but those also of those other treaty powers at a time when the lives of the hated foreigners were threatened and circumstances were changing. He coped admir admirably. Now, Mitford didn't have the language training which was being developed for members of the fledgling Japan Conscience Service, but through his own initiative, he mastered the language, both written and spoken. Among the linguistic tasks that felt him was interpreting in 1869 between the young Emperor Meiji and the Duke of Edinburgh. Not the present one, <laughs> <laughs> but Queen Elizabeth's son, Queen Victoria's son, who was the first British world visitor to Japan. Now, drawing on the many letters which Mitford wrote to his father while in Japan, um, thanks to the help of Lord Rizzo. Uh, um, Robert Morton gives a graphic back picture of the major restoration as the re resolution, a revolution has come to be called through the eyes of a talented and well-placed observer. Sadly to let no one today has the time or inclination to write these sorts of letters. <coughs> Emails and postings on Facebook will hardly meet the needs of researchers. Now, but I urge anyone who is interested in the history of modern Japan and the development of relations between Britain and Japan to read this fascinating account, one of the most significant episodes in world history. I think um, Robert will not mind if I refer to my own book, original book, um, Mitford's Japan, because I was fascinated by Mitford. And I put together um, some of the writings of that literature. I didn't do the research which Robert has done. And I think Robert's book is a fantastic um, and good uh, picture of the Japan of the Revolution, particularly Osaka, the Osaka area during the, 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 this period, and how it was like to work. In, in these very different circumstances. Remember that Japan was, had no modern transport. To get around, you either want your feet or on a horseback. You, there were no carriages. Um, so 
I'm very grateful to Robert for having put this together. I think historians will also welcome what he has done in bringing to life that theory. So I'm now going to pass on to, to Robert, and I hope you'll forgive me if I've taken some of these. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very, very much, Sir Hugh. Uh, I would just like to say uh, how important Sir Hugh's uh, research and books have been uh, for, for so many Japan scholars. Uh, and without him, I couldn't possibly have written this book. Uh, and uh, you lit the way for other people to be able to find uh, out more about Major Japan. So thank you very much. Occasionally, you get the perfect match of person and events, circumstances. Um, Churchill, when he became Prime Minister in 1940, said, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. Obviously, Mitford was in a very different situation, but I, I was reminded of Churchill having said this by the way that Mitford so perfectly fitted in to Japan, uh, the, the turbulence of the era, and how he managed to uh, record what he saw there. Mitford, incidentally, was related to Churchill for his wife, so his wife and Churchill's wife were both called Clementine, uh, and they were aunt and niece. And in fact, uh, it's very likely that Mitford was Clementine Churchill's father. <laughs> you needed to be a very special kind of person to be able to cope with uh, 1860s Japan, as Sir Hugh was saying. Um, here is a picture from the Illustrated London News of an attack on the British legation in 1861, five years before Mitford went there. Uh, so you'll see, uh, this was at night. Uh, they left the, there, there were about 150 Japanese guards, but somehow all of them managed to miss seeing these intruders come in. It was in the, it was in the summer, and the doors were left open to keep it cool. Uh, and so people woke up and suddenly they realised they were being attacked. And this man uh, here, the only thing he could grab hold of was this uh, whip. So he used that to defend himself. So the, uh, Brit the British minister, Rutherford Alcock, mm -hmm. described living in Japan like this, with a perpetual menace of assassination on the one hand and incendiarism on the other, while earthquakes almost every week shake the houses to their foundations, I cannot say the post of diplomatic agent in Edo is to be recommended to nervous people. <laughs> <coughs> the first peril of Japan was the journey and the danger of shipwreck on the way, not to mention seasickness. Uh, Mitford was very unfortunate in being a great traveller, but absolutely hating the motion of boats. Um, this is the ship that he sailed on to Japan, it's called the Cadiz, uh, and you'll see at this time it was a hybrid between a steamship and sails. Uh, coal was expensive, so if the wind was blowing they would use the sails, uh, and if, if they needed to control the ship more then they would get the steam going. Uh, Mitford said to his father, I thank my stars that you did not send me to sea when I was a youngster. He was a very unlucky sailor. He always seemed to be caught in storms. Uh, and on his way to Thai Japan, he was caught in a terrifying typhoon. Uh, the force of the wind, he wrote, was so great that it blew the foam like a carpet spread over the waves. In some ways, Mitford was a typical 19th century imperialist. And as Sir Hugh said, particularly in old age, he was the absolute perfect Edwardian gentleman. Um, he was usually immaculately dressed. 
He had perfect manners. He was fearless in danger. But where he didn't fit that was he couldn't take himself that seriously. He had a sense of humour, and he would also sometimes question whether it was all worthwhile. He wrote when Japan was exploding into civil war in 1868, I have seen the so-called march of Western civilization both in China and Japan, and I have seen it as a curse to both nations. He believed that the West should act fairly to weaker nations, not exploit them. He also believed that Westerners should respect their values and shouldn't try to seek, seek to convert them to Christianity. As Sir Hugh said, he also took the trouble to learn the language, which was extremely uh, unusual for someone in the diplomatic service, because they, they were generally moved around. So it was a huge investment of effort and time uh, learning Japanese for what turned out to be a three and a half year stay. He also tried very hard to learn Japanese customs and manners, which was also very unusual. And he didn't see himself as being superior to the Japanese. Uh, here is a photograph of his, him with his students. This is him. Uh, he's in traveling clothes. Well, he's still pretty smartly turned out. But uh, when he was working, he was in a uh, perfect British uh, suit. Uh, this is his servant, Liu Fu. And this is uh, his colleague and friend, uh, Ernest Sato, who, as Sir Hugh said, was a uh, very great linguist and scholar, actually much, much superior to Mitford. Mm -hmm. uh, and the person behind Sato was his boy, who used to do odd jobs for him. And this was Sato's Japanese servant, who was a samurai. So I don't know if you can see, he's, he samurai had to carry two swords, so he's carrying his two swords. Um, so I feel looking at this picture, you can't really tell who's the boss here. And I think it was quite unusual for people to be photographed with their servants in such an equal uh, way. Courage was uh, the most important quality that you needed to survive in Japan in the 1860s. Uh, and I think he probably learnt it at Eton. He was sent to Eton at the age of nine. Um, and uh, the bullying was absolutely dreadful uh, in the years that uh, he was there. And he talked about methods of torture, curious and ingenious, that he was subjected to. Um, he witnessed fights. There was a fight that resulted in the death of Lord Shaftesbury's younger brother in 1825. Uh, and he said that he witnessed fights that were nearly as bad. But actually, he didn't think they should be stopped because he thought it was better for boys to have things out rather than <laughs> bottle things up. Um, so they, they looked at things differently to us. So I feel that that was probably very good training for coming to Japan. He didn't do very well at Eton, but he managed to go on to Oxford uh, and he discovered uh, in adulthood that he was actually a very good writer. And once he uh, got his style, he was very successful. Of course, he's not the only Mitford who was a successful writer. Uh, his great-grandfather was a very famous historian in the 18th century. And of course, the Mitford sisters, these six sisters, uh, four of whom have became best-selling writers, uh, are very famous. Uh, to, even today. Uh, his most significant work was called Tales of Old Japan, published in 1871. So it was just after he returned to England. Uh, it's a jumble of a book, really. It's, it, it describes some real incidents, uh, some legends, ghost stories, fairy tales. What he tried to do was to show how the Japanese felt about themselves in this book. Uh, and it was very sympathetic to Japan. He depicts the Japanese as being in many ways superior uh, to Westerners, particularly in their views of honor and duty. He felt that the beliefs underpinning their 
culture were utterly different to those of Westerners, but once they were understood, he thought that their behaviour was reasonable. He was the first writer to show the Japanese as real people, as human beings, rather than these very strange uh, types. For those who were, uh, so this was coincided with the Japan boom. The Japan boom was really at full force in the 1870s. Uh, and so artists and writers were fascinated by this book. Um, for example, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the pre-Raphaelite <coughs> artist, wrote that it was the first Western revelation that has ever been made of the soul of the Japanese. And he helped to inspire artists like <coughs> Whistler, um, who lived next, Whistler lived next door to him in Chelsea, uh, and they discussed Japan a great deal. Uh, helped to inspire Whistler. So uh, I've, I've put these two paintings together. This is, on the left, is a picture of Old Battersea Bridge, which was this wonderful wooden bridge. It was terribly dangerous, <laughs> but artists loved it. It was the only wooden bridge over the Thames, and eventually it was taken down and replaced by the bridge that there is there now. Uh, and it's very hard to see, but there's actually fireworks going off in the background. There's a very, there's London, and I think the background is very London, but the, the bridge and the fireworks and the boat are very Japan. Probably the two most famous works that we have on the Japan still are Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado and Puccini's Madame Butterfly. In both uh, works, Japan is depicted as a very exotic country with very distinct customs. In both, there's a blend of daintiness and delicacy with bloodthirstiness, and of course, uh, uh, of course, Gilbert and Sullivan get great comic value out of that, uh, out of that strange mixture. Um, Mitford assisted Gilbert and Sullivan with the writing of the uh, Mikado. They wanted uh, the, the costumes and the sets to be authentic, and they were actually pretty authentic. Uh, and he also gave him the song, uh, Mia Sam, Mia Sama. Uh, <coughs> Mitford, Mitford gave them that song, which is the song which introduces the, uh, the emperor. So Mitford, in a way, was contributing to the stereotyping of Japan by assisting with the Mikado, uh, at the same time as he was trying to set people straight on what Japan was really like in his Tales of Old Japan. Mitford's enthusiasm for Japan took quite a long time to develop. <coughs> At the start, he absolutely hated it, particularly the town that he was in at the start, Yokohama, uh, which he arrived from China on the 3rd of October, 1866. <coughs> Yokohama was new. It had only been founded in 1859, uh, and it had seemed a good place to put the foreigners, very troublesome people. Uh, there would only be trouble if they were in Edo, which is now Tokyo, which was the effective capital. So put them in a town uh, a bit away from Edo, uh, and they'll, they'll be a lot better off. Um, it was actually surrounded by water, so they could, they could control who entered the town, so it made it safer. So people who wanted to assassinate foreigners would find it more difficult to get in. So the, the town was uh, separated, so this section was the western section, uh, this was the Japanese section, and this was the pleasure district. So it was, it was connected to the, the town by this lovely little path of tea houses going along here. So uh, you could never be any, you couldn't go very surreptitiously because you had to walk along this path. Uh, but once you were there, um, it was absolutely beautiful. It was by far the most beautiful place in Yokohama. It had these lovely gardens, it had theatres, it had beautiful um, lacquer um, buildings, and it was really very nice to look at. Um, unfortunately, uh, they had... Uh, um, 
So sorry, Midford lived in the Japanese section because it was cheaper, and he liked the idea of living in the Japanese style. So he wrote about his lovely little, his his lovely little Japanese cottage, which is which was really very pretty in a tiny way with its clean mats and paper. Um, so he loved the cottage until there was this devastating fire which burnt out the whole of the Japanese section. It didn't actually manage, they managed to save the western section, but sadly it, it went along the tea houses and went to the um, pleasure area. Uh, and the pleasure area, as you can see, is surrounded by water. And this was so that the women who worked there couldn't get out. They were essentially um, virtually slaves in there. They, they weren't allowed out. And so many of them died in that fire because they couldn't escape. But uh, Mifflin became really very bitter about Japan as a result of this fire. Uh, he, he lost absolutely everything in it. Uh, and he said it had disgusted him with Japan, adding, I hate the Japanese. Treachery and hatred are the only qualities which they show us. Um, so uh, he, st he was like that at the start, but then when he wrote his memories uh, 50 years later, uh, he was much more rosy, rosy eyed about Japan. It had, he, he, he just really had it, uh, loved it a lot more. Uh, and so there, in his memories, he talks about this view of Mount Fuji from Yokohama, which is beautiful. So he wrote on his second day in Japan, suddenly, coming in full view of Mount Fuji, snow-capped, rearing its matchless cone heavenward in one gracefully curving slope from the sea level. I was caught by the fever of intoxication, a fever which burns to this day and will continue to burn in my veins to the end of my life. So, as I say, he, he was uh, ambivalent, very ambivalent about, the truth is he was very ambivalent about Japan at the start. And one of the things he didn't like, he quite liked these, they used to have these very, very long processions uh, for the feudal lords had to go from their domain to visit Edo, uh, and they would go in extreme, some of them were extremely long, they could be thousands of men long, soldiers, uh, and they demanded absolute respect. So they had someone walking in front of them, telling people to get down, so ordinary people had to get down on the floor, on the ground, with their foreheads pressed against the ground, and if they didn't do that, they would just be slashed with a sword. So, you did it. <laughs> um, so, Mitford would come across these endless trains, uh, and he felt he had the right as a diplomat to go where he wanted. But uh, in 1862, a British group had tangled with one of these processions from Satsuma in southern Kyushu, which left one of them dead and two wounded. Uh, so, Mitford was a bit more uh, circumspect with the way he dealt with them. But he wrote, the outrageous pride and vanity of the Japanese character passes all belief, and we have to give in to it or risk a row in which we are sure to get the worst of it. But, as I say, this was, this was at the start in Yokohama. He was really very unhappy with Japan, but he, he did come to like the country, and he even came to quite like the processions. And he wrote about uh, the armour with crested helms and fiercely mustachioed visors, the attendants ready to punish with instant death any insolent fellow who might presume to cross their line of march. So he changed his mind about Japan a great deal. He liked Japan more as he became more involved with it. He was present at one of the first meetings of the Japanese shogun <coughs> with Westerners. So at the time when he arrived, the country was, uh, the, the shogun was the main authority in Japan, and this was the last one. Um, Mitford described him saying he was very firm, but he has a gentle and very winning expression, adding, he was the handsomest man according to our ideas that I saw during all the years that I was in Japan. Unfortunately, when Mitford arrived, 
uh, his regime was crumbling. And writing years later, he said, he was a great noble if ever there was one. The pity of it was that he was an anachronism. Mitford was likewise impressed by Emperor Meiji, who was 15 when he first had an audience of him. Uh, Mitford and his boss, Harry Parks, were the first Westerners ever to see a Japanese emperor. Uh, Mitford was very excited, wrote a great deal about it. He described the emperor as a remarkably hybrid looking youth, as indeed he has every right to be. He has a bright eye, good features, and a clear complexion. He is dressed in a white coat with long, long padded scarlet trousers trailing like a lady's tail, train. His teeth are blackened, his eyebrows shaved and painted up in up high on his forehead. His lips are stained red. Paul Mikado was a victim to tradition, and yet, in spite of all this grotesque disfigurement, the Son of Heaven contrives to look dignified. Mm -hmm. Experiences like these strongly affected Mitford's feelings about being in Japan. He realised he was at the, in the country at such an exciting time when it was just starting to open to, up to the West. And he started to feel very proud of uh, these, having had these experiences. And so he became a lot more sympathetic to the country. But there was one event that really, really uh, marked the, the, the real change uh, in Mitford's attitude to Japan. Uh, and it came out of the revolution that occurred in 1868. Uh, and this story says quite a lot about Mitford, so I'll spend a bit of time telling it. We're in Osaka, uh, and it's January 1868. Here's a picture of Osaka Castle, which unfortunately was largely destroyed in the fighting that year. Uh, all the foreign diplomats are in, the, in Osaka, uh, and it's where the government of the country is basically uh, being conducted. There's fighting going on, and on the 30th of January, they're informed that they're not safe in Osaka, and that they will have to evacuate to Kobe. At 2.30 on the following morning, they're told they have to leave immediately. And Mitford dis de describes fighting for boats which were not forthcoming in the general panic and such a row. Bigger items had to be left. And so Mitford, who was a great collector, lost another great lot of things. He, he, he was constantly collecting things and then losing them in some disaster or other. Colbert and Osaka are only 19 miles apart, but there was no train, so this is, this is Colbert, and there was no train, so the safest option was to go by boat, so they could go through the canals of Osaka and then out into the sea to Colbert. However, Mitford was ordered to ride in charge of a mounted escort because there were not enough boats to transport the horses. It was a hellish journey. A snowstorm was raising, raging. They did not know the exact direction they were going, and they needed boats to cross the river. They saw several hundred Japanese soldiers on the, on, who were in the same position. Mitford had no idea whether they would be friendly to foreigners or not, but he approached the commander of the troops on his own. He writes about casually lighting a cigar uh, and addressing him with utmost ceremony. So not only did, by this stage, he spoke very, Jap very good Japanese, but he also had acquired the manners that would succeed in Japan. Uh, so he told this commander where he was going and what he, what he was doing, and the man then, nat as we naturally would, responded very politely as well. So it was very, in this chaos of civil war and a snowstorm, there was this very, very polite conversation <laughs> going on between the two men. Uh, and Mitford said he was very sorry for disturbing the soldiers, and the man said, oh no, we're very sorry for getting in your way. Uh, and so Mitford, uh, the, the commander, ordered the ferry boat to take Mitford's party across. And then when he caught up with him, uh, he gave orders for his troops to present arms to Mitford's men and escort them into Colbert. Unfortunately, Colbert turned out to be more dangerous than Osaka. 
On the 4th of February, the legation staffs were going about their business, busy with the extra work the situation had created. Colbert had just been open to foreign trade on the 1st of January, and they were in the recently created foreign uh, settlement, which was uh, on this, on this uh, waterfront. Um, it was a fine day, and most people were outside, uh, and some of them stopped to see the sight of several hundred uh, Japanese troops marching towards Osaka. They turned out to be uh, haters of foreigners, and suddenly the soldiers stood opposite them and fired six or seven volleys straight at them. Most of the foreign representation were in clear view, but luckily the rifles had been imported from America and the men did not understand the sights on the rifles, so they were firing too high. So it was very, very lucky, and nobody was killed. But the building behind was riddled with bullets. <laughs> Mirford said if they were bad marksmen, they were mighty runners, and all of them managed to escape from the foreign legation guards. Needless to say, this wasn't what changed Mirford's attitude towards Japan. What changed his attitude was the way the emperor and his ministers handled the situation afterwards. They sentenced the commander of the troops, Taki Zenzaburo, to perform harakiri. The ceremony had never before been seen by Westerners, but this time uh, the foreign representatives were invited so that they could be sure that the punishment was carried out. So Mitford went with uh, Sato, uh, and he was absolutely entranced by this ceremony and wrote an account of it which has become a classic. Uh, and now I'm honoured that Paul Norbury, my esteemed publisher, uh, who uh, has done so much for Japanese studies for many years, is going to read Mitford's account of the Hanukkah. And it's a picture of it. Well, here goes. <laughs> it was an imposing scene. A large hall with a high roof supported by dark pillars of wood. From the ceiling hung a profusion of those huge gilt lamps and ornaments peculiar to Buddhist temples. In front of the high altar, where the floor, covered with beautiful white mats, is raised some three or four inches from the ground, was laid a rug of scarlet felt. Tall candles, placed at regular intervals, gave out a dim, mysterious light, just sufficient to let all the proceedings be seen. The seven Japanese, who were witnesses, took their places on the left of the raised floor, the seven foreigners on the right. No other person was present. After an interval of a few moments of anxious suspense, Taki Zenzaburo, a stalwart man, 32, uh, 32 years of age, with a noble air, walked into the hall attired in his dress of ceremony with the peculiar hempen cloth wings which are worn on great occasions. He was accompanied by a, a kaishaku and three officers who wore the jimburi, or war surcoat with gold tissue facings. The word kaishaku, it should be observed, is one to which our, world, uh, our, our word executioner is no equivalent term. The office is that of a gentleman. In many cases it is performed by a kinsman or friend of the condemned, and the relation between them is rather that of principal and second than that of a victim and executioner. In this instance, the Kaishaku was a pupil of Taki Zenzaburo and was selected by the friends of the latter from among their own number for his skill in swordsmanship. With the Kaishaku on his left hand, Taki Zenzaburo advanced slowly towards the Japanese witnesses and the two bowed before them. 
Then, drawing near to the foreigners, they saluted us in the same way, perhaps even with more deference. In each case, the salutation was ceremoniously returned. Slowly and with great dignity, the condemned man mounted on the raised floor, prostrated himself before the high altar twice, and seated himself on the felt carpet with his back to the high altar, the kaishaku crouching on his left-hand side. One of the three officers then came forward, bearing a stand of the kind used in temples for offerings, on which, wrapped in paper, lay the wakizashi, the short sword or dirk of the Japanese, nine and a half inches in length, with a point and an edge as sharp as a razor's. This he handed, prostrating himself, to the condemned man who received it reverently, raising it to his head, head with both hands and placed it in front of himself. After another profound obeisance, Taki Zenzaburo, in a voice which betrayed so much emotion and hesitation as might be expected from a man who is making a painful confession, but with no sign of either in his face or manner, spoke as follows. I, and I alone, unwarrantably gave the order to fire on the foreigners at Kobe, and again as they tried to escape, for this crime I disembowel myself, and I beg you who are present to do me the honor of witnessing the act. Bowing once more, the speaker allowed his upper garments to slip down to his girdle and remain naked to the waist. Carefully, according to custom, he tucked his sleeves under his knees to prevent himself from falling backwards for a noble Japanese gentleman should die falling forwards. Deliberately, with a steady hand, he took the dirk that lay before him. He looked at it wistfully, almost affectionately. For a moment, he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time, and then stabbing himself deeply below the waist and on the left-hand side, he drew the dirk slowly across to the right side and turning it in the wound, gave a slight cut upwards. During this sickeningly painful operation, he never moved a muscle of his face. When he drew out the dirk, he leant forward and stretched out his neck. An expression of pain for the first time crossed his face, but he uttered no sound. At that moment, the Kaishaku, who still crouching by his side, had been keenly watching every movement, sprang to his feet, poised his sword for a second in the air. There was a flash, a heavy, ugly thud, a crashing fall. With one blow, the head had been severed from the body. A dead silence followed, broken only by the hideous noise of the blood throbbing out of the inert heat before us, which but a moment before had been a brave and chivalrous man. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. Um, unfortunately, this picture is very inaccurate, it's, um, but it's the only one that I could find. But it does show the, uh, the foreigners. Oh, oh. Oh. Anyway, it does. Oh, it's this one, isn't it? Yes. It does show the foreigners sitting there watching. Uh, so um, I suppose this is the moment at which. He has uh, drawn the drawn the short dagger across his across his stomach, uh, and so he's put his head forward to have it chopped off. Uh, so um, 
This is a, a classic account of a, of a harakiri, and it's one of the most famous pieces of writing from uh, 19th century Japan by a Westerner. And so with that, we're closed. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.